Joining us right now, Mary, is a powerhouse of a businesswoman uh, who, with her husband and another partner, started a small toy company in their garage and turned it into the $300 million a year giant known as Mattel. She is responsible for the creation of the Barbie doll, which became the biggest selling toy in history. After retiring as president of Mattel in 1974, she founded a company that revolutionized the design of artificial breasts for women who have mastectomies. Uh, that product is called Nearly Me, and it's become a spectacular success once again. She's done it twice in her lifetime. Would you welcome Ruth Handler? <laughs> company well, but we don't know the story of its beginnings. Where did it all happen? Where was that garage? And is it a monument today? <laughs> it's not a monument. No. In fact, the Olympic Freeway, uh, the Olymp, the Boulevard Olympic. It goes right uh, through it? Widened it and goes right through it. <laughs> God. <laughs> How did it all happen? What were you doing at the time? Well, we had had another business prior to Mattel, and I had taken time out to have a couple of kids. Yeah. And uh, uh, what really happened has never been told before, and I'll tell it to you. Good. Um, the man who was foreman for this other business which we had uh, quit that company. He got in a fight with one of my husband's partners. Right. And my husband and I went to visit him on a Sunday, and I said, what are you going to do, Matt? He said, I'd like to make some of Elliot's old designs. I says, I tell you what. Now I had two kids, and I was bored as hell staying home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I says, I tell you what, you make them, I'll sell them. He says, neat. He says, what shall we make? I says, picture frames. Picture so, frames? Yeah. So he made picture frames. Elliot designed them. Elliot's your husband. My husband. Right. And Elliot was at this other place. Right. And uh, I uh, went out and sold them. And... Uh, that was the beginning of Mattel. Matt and Elliot, we looked for names to put together, and that's how it started. Uh, in those days, I didn't know Ruth should be in the name. Ah, I'm anyway. sorry now. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> My present company is named Ruthton Corporation. Right, there you go. Um, and uh, we had some picture frames left over. And, uh, we had some slats of wood left over. And My husband said, hey, that'd make neat doll furniture. And that's how Mattel started. From leftovers. From leftover scraps of wood. What I could do with my reruns. <laughs> <laughs> children's furniture. Huh. So, from, do you remember the first toy? Was it children's first furniture? First toy was children's furniture. For and little then, doll's houses? You for mean doll houses, yeah. yeah. And then came the you could doodle, and then a plastic piano, and then a burp gun, and, and then, of course, Barbie. Barbie. Yeah. Tell me if you will. OK, let it all out. We'll get to the Barbie story in a minute. But tell, if you will, how Mattel jumped in leaps and bounds. I mean, the grosses each year were uh, unbelievable. I mean, they didn't, it didn't go from one million to two million to three million to four million. It just went crazy, didn't it? Our first year, we did $100,000. And our second what year... What year was that? 1945. 45. Yeah. Our second year, we did $100,000, but got slapped in the face because competition came in heavily. Mm -hmm. And then we went to a half a million, a million three, and five million, nine million, fourteen and a half million, nineteen million, twenty-six million, forty-nine million, seventy-six, ninety-six. That's true, Merv, year after year. If you try to figure it out, I don't know how it happened. Uh, wh where did it peak? Where did it go? It went well over. Th it, I left Mattel somewhere between three hundred and four hundred million. Did you just sell out and say, that's it? Oh, no. We had some very severe business reverses, and uh, uh, I left. Whoops. Somewhat unwillingly. Really? <laughs> yeah. Talk now first about the Barbie doll. That was the incredible success of Mattel, wasn't it? Yes. That was the real big jump in we had We had many, many successes, like Hot Wheels and, well, you know, lots of them. Yeah. But the Barbie doll... Uh, How'd that happen? It happened... 
interestingly enough, we were making things like musical instruments and guns. And it was time to diversify into another kind of a product. And we decided we had to get into the doll business. And uh, the, we never copied anyone in anything we ever did. You led. We led, always. And we felt that if you, and incidentally, this is an important formula for anybody who wants to go into business. The product has to be, have a reason to be. Otherwise, you shouldn't be in it. So when we decided we should go into the doll business, the question is, how could we be different? I had observed my own daughter, Barbie, playing with paper dolls through the years when she was growing up. Saturdays were my day with her. And we used to go into the dime store and buy paper dolls. And she would always choose the Harold Teen or the uh, Tilly the Toiler or the adult tie paper dolls, never the 10-year-olds or the baby paper dolls. And I would watch her play with the paper dolls. And she was role-playing her dream of her teenage years. And she was also with her friends projecting her vision of the adult world around her. And I used to think, my goodness, if you could three-dimensionalize that play pattern, you'd have something. So when it became time for us to go in the doll business, uh, there were fashion dolls on the market, but they were flat-chested and they didn't have really good-looking clothes with lots of detail and they didn't have the accessories for teenage projection. And how do you play grown up with a flat-chested, full-bellied, 10-year-old type doll? You don't. So I said, let's make a doll with breasts and narrow waist and narrow ankles and let's make her look like a teenager. We had once seen a caricature typed all of that general type in Europe, but not really like Barbie. Anyway, uh, we did it. Did the customers, were they thrilled at different stores? And no, they thought it would be a total dud. We went to Toy Show. It took us three years from concept. I think we started to design the doll when my own daughter Barbie was about 10. By the time we brought it to market, she was like 13 or 14. Mm. Um, we brought it to market and took it to Toy Show, and the buyers just uh, turned us off. They weren't interested. Not more than 50% of the buyers bought Barbie. They regretted it later because when we delivered, the thing just ran away from Sold us. Sold out of the stores? Oh. Immediately? The consumer knew what she wanted and appreciated what we were giving, and we could never catch up with the demand for Where, were the, where was Barbie years. made, here in America? No, we went to Japan. That was our first venture. Many toy manufacturers had started going to Japan, and we had not yet gone there. And uh, everybody told me in, in our place, you can't make the doll with the details and the fingernails and, the, and all that stuff that we put on her with the zippers and the buttons and the de They said, you can't do it in the United States and sell it at a price. Well, we had been wanting to go to Japan, as others were doing, because costs were getting higher. And we realized that this doll would have to sell too high mm -hmm. in price. At that time, $3. No, a dollar and a half, forgive me. Right, right. Anyway, uh, but that was too high in those days. I'm getting my numbers mixed. I think it was a dollar and a half wholesale and three dollars retail. Right. At any rate, uh, the uh, need to make it less expensively with all that detail caused us to send people to Japan to work to get the product set up there, and that's what we did. Now, as corporate head of this powerful company, as you call it, and, and powerful it certainly is. It was and right? is powerful. Right. It's a man's world. You better believe it. Right. How'd you function? Well, remember I started with my husband so that I functioned. Uh, I really didn't know initially that women weren't supposed to do all this stuff, and I kind of rode roughshod over the men that were uh, that I associated with on the outside, and I worked every day of my life to earn the respect of the individuals who worked for me. Any funny things ever come out of it? I mean, oh, lots of funny really? things, lots of funny things. It, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, I found very often being a woman, see in those days it was not fashionable for a woman to be in business. I knew no women who were heads of corporations right. or uh, in big dollars, you right. know, in those days. Um, and yeah, I had a funny experience once and I'll describe it to you. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I would say, before I tell you that experience, that 
I had certain fun being a woman dealing with men, and now talking about on the outside, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they didn't know how to relate to me, and they were kind of thrown by dealing with me, and they were always ill at ease, or uh, they didn't, couldn't relate, you know, they were in trouble. And then, uh, very often, they were very hard to deal with, and uh, didn't feel that I could deal with them. And eventually, I would win them over, and, th and they were always off base, off keel. Uh, they were out of, um, what shall I say, I, I had them off kilter. And I always got what I wanted before, uh, because they didn't know what was happening to what them. What was the funny story of them? The funny story is, one day I had an appointment with a man. Uh, I don't remember who he was. He came in from somewhere. He comes into my office. He sits down across from my desk. And he said, um, uh, and we started to talk. And he looked at me. He said, you're not at all like I expected. And I said, oh, why not? He says, no, not at all. I says, why not? What's different? I, what did you expect? He says, well, I expected someone who was going to be leaning back in a chair with her feet crossed up on the desk and a cigar in her mouth. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> did it make you think? Well, I tell you, it threw me, and it hurt me, and it really made me think. And I realized that it's very, very important for a woman in business to retain her femininity. And Apparently, he had heard what a powerhouse I was, and somehow he visualized this masculine type individual. It really bothered me, and I, it renewed something I knew that I had to do, which was retain my femininity mm. in this world. And I think that's why it hit me so hard. Are you when a feminist? I lost my, am I a feminist? Whoops. I was not, and I think I am. Really? <laughs> why the change? I don't think I was conscious of women or particularly knew them or respected them or liked them in my aggressive business years. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point in my life when I started going through the reversals and I started finding women friends, and when I got into this breast business, when I started fitting women with breasts and I got to know women, I learned to love them. And Something else happened, and I learned to relate to them. I used to, during my early corporate years, when we'd go to a social event, I'd cluster in a corner with the men. I didn't want to talk to the women. I thought they were boring. Now, when I go to a social event, I don't want to talk to the men. I like the women better. We're going to take a commercial break and return. <laughs> this is the famous Barbie doll we all know so well. Is there any number on how many that's sold? No, there are no published numbers, but there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of volume in the Barbie doll. This is the original, and she's pretty old-fashioned, but this is the original Barbie. Yeah. And she, you know, in those days, they didn't make dolls with breasts, and the big thing was breasts and ankles and all that. You know, it's ironic, Merv. Dress to breast. That's where I am in life. <laughs> Not a bad business. Uh, 